Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Andrew Harris uh, here today, uh, not least because his work on Anchorian archaeology resonates with the important work of our recently departed dear colleague, the archaeologist Michael Coe, who, as many of you know, has a, had a long history of important work into Anchorian archaeology. And also, as many of you know, here at Yale, we have a longstanding scholarly engagement with Cambodia um, under the stewardship of my wonderful colleague, Ben Kiernan, in the history department. Um, I'm also excited for the ways that Andrew's work might intersect with a burgeoning interest in Buddhist studies here at Yale, which is guided by another of my wonderful colleagues, Hwan Su Kim, who is also the chair of the Council of East Asian Studies. Um, Dr. Harris uh, recently competed, completed his PhD in archaeology at the University of Toronto, where he is currently still based while directing the Angkor Vihara project, which is a collaboration between Cambodia's Apsara National Authority and the Archaeology Center of the University of Toronto, which is dedicated to the research, excavation, and publication of early Theravada Buddhist archaeology at Angkor. Dr. Harris is a previous recipient of the Robert H. N. Ho Dissertation Fellowship in Buddhist Studies and has published his work in World Archaeology and Medieval Worlds with upcoming publications in Artibus, ACA, Asian Archaeology, and the Brill Handbook in Memory Studies, which we just heard about briefly from my colleague Guan Zhan. Um, I have much more to say about Andrew's work and how excited I am to have him here, but nobody came here to listen to me. So I'm going to pause here and just ha ask you all to join me as we welcome Dr. Andrew Harris to our virtual series. His talk is entitled The Introduction of Theravada Buddhism to Angkor, Cambodia, circa 13th through 16th centuries, mapping and interpreting religious change through the archaeological record. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Harris. So I want to thank, of course, uh, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies for inviting me to their brown bag seminar series. It's a great honor to be able to present all in front of you. Um, as uh, Eric mentioned, my name is Andrew Harris. I've never been called doctor so many times in a row at this point, so I'm very happy about that. I uh, am a research associate at the Archaeology Center of the University of Toronto, and I'm also a sessional lecturer at Trent University, Durham. So before I get started, I want to acknowledge several people, organizations, and funding bodies who have been integral to uh, getting my research completed and completing my dissertation, especially those members of APSAR National Authority who have been generous with granting us permits and rights to excavate the incredible archaeological record of Cambodia and Angkor. So today's talk uh, is primarily going to cover as the title suggests, the religious transition and transformation of Angkor and notably Angkor Thom in Cambodia. And we're gonna cover a few distinct topics. First, starting with religion, statecraft and temple cosmology in what is often anachronistically known as Indianized Cambodia and Southeast Asia. I'm gonna cover a little bit about Angkor Thom, the theater of early Theravada Buddhist placemaking at Angkor what entails Buddhist terrace archaeology and Theravada monastic construction at Angkor. Then we'll talk about converted temples, which are the major evidence for evolving perceptions of past religious spaces. Then I will talk about social memory, uh, a heuristic known as foci of memory, which I'll discuss what that is later, and how that affected Buddhist terrace construction, as well as the 16th century restoration of Angkor Wat, which is probably the best known event um, within Angkor's Theravada Buddhist archaeological record. And then finally, I'll discuss briefly how mapping religious transition in the archaeological record might take place. But the major thesis woven through this presentation is that Theravada Buddhism could not have been successful in its spread at Angkor without a standardized reckoning with Angkor's temple spaces. As a case study almost similar to the adoption of Christianity in Rome, with admittedly a less pilfered archaeological record, we ask the question of how religious transition occurs within established religious societies, and how can we map this through the archaeological record? The Angkorian or Khmer Empire was a geopolitical entity which at its peak encompassed much of Thailand, Laos, and southern Vietnam from the 9th century to the 15th century CE. 
although forms a single episode within a continuous uninterrupted Cambodian culture and civilization, which have existed since at least the second millennium BCE. The region of Angkor, which is shown on the right, was the beating heart and is found within a 1,000 square kilometer area of urban and religious development, including temples, monasteries, walls, embankments, canals, road, and a massive infrastructure of undocumented wooden buildings. This area, which is often seen as a single urban entity, is purported to have been the world's largest pre-industrial settlement with population estimates ranging between 750,000 to a million. An essential to understanding Angkor's development is the establishment of Indic religion, both Hinduism and Buddhism in Cambodia. These traditions arrived in Southeast Asia initially via maritime trade or overland between the second century BCE and fifth century CE and are first recorded by Chinese traders uh, who noted that Cambodian policies practiced both traditions during the at least fifth to seventh century CE. Just to back up a moment, there are two schools of Buddhism practiced that were practiced within Cambodian history. We're going to leave Vajrayana Buddhism on the table for a minute, but these are Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. In the simplest terms, the major difference is the latter's focus on collective enlightenment through the worship of bodhisattvas or Buddhist saints and the construction of great works. Theravada Buddhism, which is also known as Sinhalese Buddhism, is derived from the teachings of the Pali Canon from the Mahavihara Monastery in Sri Lanka, practiced there since the second century BCE, which were in turn reinterpreted by populations in Burma and Thailand in the following millennia. This important point emphasizes that only in scripture are these traditions similar to what is found in South Asia material. Southeast Asia created traditions that were tied into indigenous forms of rulership and religious practices surrounding the elements, water, which often became a trope associated with the much later idea of oriental despotism and ancestral veneration. Therefore, this process of hybridization of Indic culture and indigenous rulerships often known as the Indianization of Southeast Asia, based off the work of the prominent 20th century epigrapher, Gilles Cides and others. Important too is that this occurred in waves it was not a specific event adopting Indic religion and culture and more often occurred between polities in Southeast Asia rather than between South and Southeast Asia. For example, between Thailand and Cambodia, which was the spread of Theravada Buddhism. Hindu and Buddhist worship, which is known collectively as Burmano Buddhism due to their shared power structures within Cambodia and other Southeast Asian polities became a way to validate and consolidate rule over divided city-states and princes. Southeast Asian polities typically function as centralized theocratic monarchies ruled by a Chakravartin or universal ruler. The king was the wielder of the Dharma or moral law and is often also incarnated as either a Hindu deity, Shiva or Vishnu, or a Bodhisattva. Typically at Angkor, Shiva was the most commonly venerated deity and the king's rule was manifested through the worship of the Shiva Linga, a stone phallus which combined with a yoni or symbol, a symbol of female fertility would bless the farmlands and provide a bountiful harvest. This king provided or presided over a stratified society of princes, Brahmanic elites, caste artisans, merchants, soldiers, and other skilled laborers, and non-caste agrarian peasants. And it's often touted that only the elites of any Southeast Asian polity practice Hinduism, although this is unclear as only a small segment of society was in fact incorporated within the Varna or caste system. The majority of society was agrarian. And the historian David Chandler notes that this caste system divided society between those who grew rice and those who did not. Within this model, scholars have long read Southeast Asian religious landscapes as a direct reflection of statehood. Archaeological analyses of Southeast Asian statehood have thus mainly focused on the manufactured environments constructed by religious power, namely the numerous Hindu and Mahayana Buddhist state temple complexes, as well as later Theravada Buddhist monasteries, as our research has illuminated, as well as their dedicatory foundation inscriptions, which were usually written in Sanskrit. And temples across, of any size or importance across the Angkorian Empire were commonly established as cosmograms representing Mount Meru, the home of the 33 gods of Hinduism ruled by Lord Indra, and a sacred axis mundi that represented one of the 31 planes of existence. The central shrine, surrounded by four towers or peaks of the mountain, as you can see here with Nomba King, housed the primary deity, either a Shivalingam or a statue of either Vishnu or a Buddha. Temples would also feature a moat or were fronted by a barai, known as a reservoir, representing the cosmic ocean and were surrounded by urban development, including hydrology and perishable wooden buildings, as also walls. 
Thus, these complexes are referred to as civic ceremonial centers. The temple here, Nomba King, was dedicated in 907 CE by Angkor's first regional king, Yashavarman I, and the area of Angkor is often known as Yashodarapura. Temples also formed at the center of their own economies. Damien Evans notes that as microcosms of the king's capital, village shrines and regional temples across the empire embody the same political and economic symbolism as state temples on a smaller scale, and essentially reinforce the political and social linkages within the network. And through his analysis of economic transactions found within epigraphy, most notably the inscription at Takio, which is the temple illustrated here from the 11th century, Kenneth R. Hall surmised that temples controlled land, the labor on the land, and the land's productive output, and thus form foci of economic systems and political mechanisms. Temples administered the distribution of resources, upheld social structures through ritual and settlement, featured indentured laborers tied to the temple known as kun, and villages were in fact tied to temples and administration. These were recorded in many inscriptions, for example, at the temple of Priya Khan, which was constructed in the late 12th century under the great King Jayavarma VII, which administered 5,324 villages, totaling 97,840 people, and had an attached retinue of dancers, priests, and temple staff. The civic ceremonial center, which will be the focus of today's talk, is Angkor Thom, a three by three kilometer walled and moated citadel constructed in the late 12th century during the rule of the great Mahayana Buddhist King Jayavarma VII as the centerpiece of his complete re-envisioning and transformation of the Angkorian heartland. Angkor Thom was constructed as a manifestation of the churning of the ocean of milk myth. And in this tale of Indic mythology, the Asuras or demons gain control of heaven, forcing King Indra of Mount Meru into exile. And these demons sought the elixir of immortality from the cosmic ocean for themselves. Vishnu, who himself sought to return Indra to his throne, implored the devas, or collectively the gods, to help the asuras for a time, but promised to keep the elixir in heaven. In his act seemed to balance the universal forces of good and evil, the devas and asuras began to churn the cosmic ocean using the Naga Vasaki as the churning mechanism. The asuras chose Mount Mandarachala as the churning post, which would create the elixir, but the mountain began to sink into the water, and Vishnu then transformed the or it transformed into a turtle one of his many avatars known as Kurma, and stabilized the mountain. And one, in fact, one of the many Abhisheka or coronation rites ascribed to Angkorian kings was the drinking of the elixir of immortality as a validation of kingship. In reference to Angkor Tom's layout, the devas and asuras still line the city's five gateways, holding enormous Naga serpents, and the enigmatic Bayon Temple, which we'll get to shortly, formed Mount Mandarachala, although excavations have not indicated whether there is in fact a giant turtle under the temple. As a walled urban area, Angkor Thom is also referred to as a city and is crisscrossed by an orthogonal road grid alongside a sophisticated hydraulic system of canals and moats, which dictated the construction of new settlement. The construction of the citadel also swallowed up Angkor's earlier political hub, which was centered on the late 9th century walled royal palace complex, which is noted as a central zone in the diagram to the bottom right, from which successive kings continue to rule. The fifth of five arterial roads, known as the Victory Gate Road, originally ran eastward from the royal palace and linked the complex to the Great East Barai, constructed by Angkor's first king, Yashavarma I. To get an extent of the size of this barai, it's 7.8 by 2.1 kilometers large. Angkor Thom is also home, finally, to the overwhelming majority of archaeological evidence for the initial adoption and dissemination of Theravada Buddhism. Jayavarman VII deserves a bit of background, as his brief subordination of Hinduism for Mahayana Buddhism is relevant to our conversation on religious transition in the archaeological record. Jayavarman was purportedly converted to this religion by his first wife, prior to the beginning of his rule, and an enormous collection of inscriptions from his reign emphasized the bodily ills of his subjects became his spiritual sufferings. The king may therefore have envisioned himself as an incarnation of either the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, who represented compassion, or the Supreme Buddha, who sat at the nexus of compassion and wisdom. The face towers on many structures constructed during his reign, as you can see in the bottom right here, are thought to represent this overwhelming cult of personality. And in any case, Jayavarman sought to ease the suffering of his subjects through the construction of great works and territorial consolidation. And in commencing the program, both the specific projects and the order in which they were completed indeed correlate with architectural styles and building schemes undertaken during the reign of earlier Hindu monarchs. Using the substantial translations of inscriptions by Jules Sedez and others, 
epigrapher Felix Stern was able to map out a rhythm of three moments of royal construction across multiple reign periods. And these would comprise, first, the foundations of public interest and a renewal of state authority, the second, the completion of an ancestral temple or temples, and third, the establishment of a temple mountain celebrating the lingam or royal cult. For Jai Varman's rule, the first rhythm included a vast infrastructural program, including the repaving of the empire's highways alongside the construction of rest houses, and a whole infrastructure of hospitals and fire shrines associated with them. The second was the construction of two satellite civic ceremonial centers, Taprom and Priya Khan, dedicated to his mother and father in central Angkor. And the third was a temple mountain of his own, the Bayon Temple at the center of Angkor Thom. This enigmatic temple, which is defined by 54 face towers, sits at the convergence of four of the five citadels arterial roads. And the temple again is both an extension of the churning of the ocean of milk, myth, as well as a more traditional incarnation of Mount Meru. Additionally, the Bayon was constructed as a complex architectural pantheon of Burmano Buddhist deities, featuring shrines to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas alongside Shiva, Vishnu, Rishi, Ganesh, and others, and was no doubt the spiritual heart of Jayavarman's vision of empire, creating an umbrella of deities, and thus the Hindu elites who worshipped them, which he ruled over. The Bayan would indeed maintain this position of power at the center of Angkor until the abandonment of the uh, citadel in the 15th century or believed abandonment. And as I'll discuss in a few slides, the Bayan also formed an important focus for Theravada Buddhist construction within Angkor Thom. And as a result of the enormous building campaign which defined his rule, Jayavarma's architectural footprint is arguably the largest of any Angkorian king, but no distinct Angkorian civic ceremonial centers followed the foundation of Angkor Thom although the reason for this is disputed. One suggestion by Damien Evans is that Jayavarman Citadel, an infrastructure already encompassed so much of Angkor's urban heartland that it no longer made sense to construct an entirely new capital from scratch. For instance, the creation of a new urban center would likely require the retooling of any number of canals within Angkor's hydraulic system, a move that was likely unfeasible due to a gradual population decline and damage to Angkor's hydrology forecast to have begun during the 13th century which was primarily due to climatic fluctuations and overexploitation, although these are all topics for another day and a scholar far more versed in this than I am. The 13th century is also uniquely marked with the return of the royal cult to Hinduism, thought to have been spearheaded by an intensive campaign of iconoclasm under the reign of Jayavarma VIII, as you can see here on the, on the right by this hacked out Buddha image at Priya Khan. And Jayavarman VIII's patronage of Hinduism also came with some original religious construction, although not in the same capacity as the earlier monarchs. And the last dated temple with Angkor, the Mangalartha, dedicated to Vishnu, was constructed in 1295 CE. Although it's unclear whether Mahayana Buddhism was continuously practiced after this period, or whether it was simply an episode within Angkor's history corresponding with the reign of Jayavarman VII. During the 13th century, if not even during the late 12th, a third religion began to gain a foothold in Cambodia in part due to Jayavarman's consolidation of the Western border of his empire. This was Theravada Buddhism, which as I previously noted is derived from Southeast Asian interpretations of Sinhalese Buddhism. Regionally, analyses of the Dvaravati material culture of Thailand by scholars such as Stephen Murphy suggest that Buddhism was practiced in the region directly proximate to Cambodia, at least by the sixth century CE, if not earlier. These Dvaravati polities, notably those on the Korat Plateau of central eastern Thailand, were almost always situated on the frontiers of several larger imperial geobodies, for example, the Burmese of Pagan and the Khmer of Angkor. The nature of the medieval Southeast Asian state is often characterized as a mandala or cosmic circle, and has been hypothesized by scholars such as Stanley Tambaya and O.W. Walters to emplace the rulership of kings in a state of boundless divine power radiating from a concentric point across a highly spiritualized territory, which we might call an empire. In this model, the borders of Southeast Asian empires, I guess we could call them that, continuously waxed and waned, constantly emphasizing the center. But very little focus has been given to the cultural transmission which occurred in this oft ignored frontier due to archeological and religious nationalism cementing history within modern borders. Although Burmese sources indicate that Jayavarma the seventh son, Tamalinda, in fact, purportedly visited the Mahavihara with Burmese monks in 1180 CE, the first account of Theravada Buddhist practice in material culture at Angkor comes from the 1296 CE writings of Zhou Daguan, entitled The Customs of Cambodia. Zhou was an envoy sent from China by Kublai Khan to survey and document the regions that China saw to be under their dominion, and also possibly because a new king, Indravarma III, had been crowned a year earlier. 
Joe arrived at Encore Tom and through a somewhat fragmented perception of foreign customs and culture, observed as many as three practicing religions. Brahmins, which he named specifically, worshippers venerating a block of stone, which possibly Shiva worshippers, and Buddhists whose monks wore saffron robes and worshipped large images of the Buddha in roofed halls, the first mention of any structure resembling what we found in the archaeological record. Joe also importantly notes that every family practiced Buddhism, which suggests that the construction of the Mangalartha a year earlier was the product of just one of the traditions of practice being or being practiced in Angkor, rather than some overnight flick of the switch, as is somewhat suggested in earlier scholarship. It's likely that Theravada had been there for a time. The king, Injabram III, was also a practicing Buddhist, and Joe notes, generally when leaving and returning to the palace, he had to visit a small gold pagoda with a Buddha in front of it. Onlurkers all had to kneel down and touch their head on the ground. Theravada Buddhist practice after this point is thought to have gradually gained ground on the remaining Hindu traditions as a religion widely practiced across all social classes. And while hierarchy indeed continued to exist within the rituals performed and practiced in monasteries, rulership appears to be less tied to connection with Hindu deities. The epigraphic language, in fact, shifted from Sanskrit to Pali, the canon language of Sinhalese Buddhism in the 14th century, and an inscription exists from 1309 CE at Kokstai Czech Temple in northwestern Cambodia, which describes the king's abdication for the life of a bhikkhu, or monk, which seems unprecedented. The king would typically have died in his position if he wasn't overthrown or killed. The last inscription dedicated to Shiva appears on the Bayon from 1327 CE, which is noteworthy as much for its dedication to a Hindu king as its inscription on a monument, which may have kept its significance as a pantheon, but certainly remained emblematic of royal authority. Theravada Buddhism also introduced a new material culture comprising of new religious and monastic spaces called vihara or prayer halls which are derived, likely derived from those found within Buddhist polities in Northern Thailand, such as Sukhothai, which was established in the 13th century, or the Dvaravati polities, which had a mind, which by the excavation of several boundary stones in Kulen may have had a minor presence in Cambodia. Archeologists refer to these distinct edifices at Angkor as either Buddhist terraces, a translation of the French classifier Terras Boudique, or Previhir, the tran Khmer translation of Vihara. The distinction though, is that Buddhist terraces comprise the archaeological substructural remains, and Pravi here represent the edifice in which Buddhist rites were performed. Like temples, the floor plan of a Buddhist terrace, oh, I went by. Buddhist terrace shown here with the example of Angkor Thom Vihir or ATP7, was to a degree standardized. That said, it's currently impossible to determine the entire structure because the wooden superstructure, which could have made up up to 90% of the building, has in all cases disintegrated due to Cambodia's jungle climate. Although from comparisons with roof structures depicted in reliefs on temples, they were likely a little different than monastic structures found in Cambodia today. In any case, almost all of these structures face east, derived from the positioning of temples in reference to Shiva, and focalized a single colossal Buddha on a statu uh, statue on a raised stone plinth at the western extremity. Above the wooden superstructure, the edifice would have been typically topped with a tiled roof. The use of roof tiles is significant because Joe de Guan explicitly describes sumptuary laws associated with using tile only in elite or royal buildings, which puts these buildings potentially under royal patronage. Indraman III, for example, is known to have dedicated land for Pravihir construction and from the 1309 inscription previously noted, so this indicates that the king's land, i.e. all land, was donated by the court to the Sangha or monastic order to build the local monastery. The most significant ritual delineator of Pravihir space are Sima, a series of blessed stone orbs or other stone deposits used to demarcate ordination spaces within a Theravada monastery. Angkorian monastic communities adopted the earlier Dvaravati tradition of erecting prominent stone markers or Sima stones over these deposits in an eight by one or eight by two formation at the cardinal and subcardinal boundaries of each Pravihir. Sima in fact have been the single most consistent variable and classifier of these former Pravihir sites during survey, and shows significant variation in both style and craftsmanship. In turn, the placement of Sima surrounding a Vihara is unique within Theravada practice in Southeast Asia, as these buildings would typically be separated into a Vihara and an Upasathagara or ordination hall, and may represent a uniquely Angkorian focalization of Theravada ritual space, which might be argued to descend from the centralization of community and ritual on a single structure existent in Hindu practice.
Highlighted amongst the supporting infrastructure of walls, causeways, and minor image houses known as Sala, a select number of Buddhist terrace complexes feature reliquary monuments of varying sizes, for more familiarly known, familiarly known as stupas, which either stand as a separate structure or are directly attached to the main complex. Reliquaries have served as repositories of statuary, treasure, and funerary remains, and if present, appear directly west of the Pravi here on an axial trajectory with both the central sanctuary and easternmost Sima. Based on the substructural remains, two main reliquary forms existed at Angkor. The first is known as a Pratiyat and resembles a small temple tower with is almost entirely unique to Angkor, while more traditional bell-shaped reliquaries, locally known as Chitti, were introduced later in the 14th or even 15th century, arguably as a product of growing Thai influence on Angkorian architecture. In the lower right corner or lower left corner, you can actually see a possible indication of the superposition between these two types of structures which is important to remember when we discuss temple conversions corresponding with Theravada Buddhist perceptions of temple space as well as how it evolved. And on the right, there are, as evidence, there are smaller funerary stupas that surround more prominent Buddhist terrace structures. This one surrounds a Buddhist terrace by the Bayon Temple. The LIDAR map illustrates the current known extent of Angkor Thom's monastic development and comprises Buddhist terraces with and without Sima stones, Although we found so many as votive deposits at the foot of central sanctuary pedestals, that is very likely many were excavated from their original positions during later periods. This amounts to 72 Pravi here within a nine square kilometer area. And while I think this number might be slightly low, the 13 identified with temples and infrastructure in central Angkor is definitely understated and requires further investigation. Still, this number represents a massive building campaign centered on Angkor Thom which through radiometric dating we've determined likely primarily occurred during the 14th century, if not slightly earlier. We're currently exploring the possibility of a purposeful monastic construction boom during this period, but this theory requires far more excavation. My methodology in mapping these structures required the use of colonial French hand-drawn maps from the early 20th century, overlaid with modern LIDAR collected by the Greater Encore Project and APSER Authority, and then two years of ground survey and cataloging. Thanks to this effort, APSERA granted us permission to excavate test pits across several sites across at Angkor Thom, which became the basis of our collaborative Angkor Bihar project. The results and observations I've presented thus far and will present are based on four seasons of field work within this region, with at least two more still to come. And just to give you a sense of the range of dates associated with Buddhist terrorist habitation, which come from three of our four excavation sites spread across Angkor Thom, as well as the context in which some of these charcoal samples we dated come from. For example, on the bottom left, to this uh, one charcoal sample came between two, from between two avian bones underneath the hand of a foot-long earth-touching Buddha at the site of Prabhupada's dismantled central sanctuary, or another came from the base of a Buddhist terrace stair staircase that we had excavated into. These, of course, are not the only dates we gathered, which included several stratigraphic samples dating from the 11th to 12th centuries. This suggests that many Buddhist terrace sites were in fact constructed in areas of previous occupation, either residential or even religious, based on the excavation of upper on the upper right, a votive deposit of a single rounded gypsum stone dated from this earlier period. This was the date associated. Although Pravi here collectively formed the most common Theravada Buddhist place of worship found within Angkor, and clearly formed anchors of religious transition and community. Rarely are these edifices given the same religious, social, or political agency as the temples which preceded them. This is odd considering the focality of the modern Wat in Cambodia and uh, Cambodian daily life. Olivier de Bernon was one of the first few, uh, one of the first scholars who asserted this agency, through his, likely through his comparison with both contemporary transregional and modern Cambodian examples, whereby, in his view, monasteries served as the grounds for interment of the dead, for the construction of stupas and reliquaries, for resource distribution many future treasuries, and also served as repositories for donations or of offerings which were typically given in the form of statues, gold, or alms of food and incense. Pravi here are also believed to have had a population of indentured laborers tied to the monastery, possibly villages, and likely functioned as anchors of local or regional economies in a similar manner to Hall's model. Although of course, this is thus far entirely undocumented. My own research, which through archaeological analysis has indeed verified many of de Bernal's observations, has sought to explore and explain the diversity of architecture within the uniform floor plan. I would this, thus acknowledge the possibility that the dissemination of Buddhism was local rather than centralized despite land being donated by the king. 
This might help explain the size of Pravi hair, the types and qualities of materials used. Our main uh, diacritic is quarried sandstone, which would come from a quarry in the Kulan Hills to the north northeast versus recycled sandstone, which likely came from a dismantled temple, as well as the craftsmanship of associated statuary and sema, the number of extant statue pedestals, the number of luxury goods, most notably Chinese export wares, gold leaf ornaments, and green glazed Khmer Celadon boxes, and the number of funerary and reliquary monuments associated with each complex. Varying access to resources and artistry by monastic populations indeed may have been a product of local social status. The wealthier your patrons and monks' families were, the more extravagant your prayer hall may have been. These ideas run in sharp contrast to the ways Angkorian scholars previously interpreted the original material output and development of Theravada in Cambodia. In fact, prayer halls and other monastic structures are often omitted from discussions of Theravada Buddhist development in Angkor entirely, often relegated as secondary and thus unimportant monuments. Prior to radiometric analysis, Buddhist monuments such as these were thought to generally date from the 15th to 19th century products of a superficial epoch known as the post angkorian or Middle Period, which was framed as the Cambodian Dark Age, following the disputed fall of Angkor in 1431 and preceding the establishment of the colonial French protectorate in 1863, a very romanticized narrative. Angkorian scholars focused on temples and inscriptions saw an absence of these two major cultural staples, temples and inscriptions, as a reflection of Angkor's decline and a breakdown of its political order, and most notably important for the early colonial French, grandeur. Conversely, a select number of Buddhist scholars influenced by the late 19th and 20th century Buddhist nationalist movements across Southeast Asia corresponding with independence interpreted Angkorian Theravada as almost a revolution against the more tyrannical Hindu and Mahayana Buddhist state structures and painted Theravada as a sort of Buddhist utopia, especially in reference to the contemporary Thai Buddhist kingdom Sukhothai. And while there's certainly some validity to the idea that Theravada worship transcended social classes in a way Hindu caste may have not, as well as the ease at which, at, of which members of lay classes could be indoctrinated as monks, thus dividing or thus coming, bringing together those who grew nice, rice and those who did not, it's very unlikely any sort of social revolution occurred as society remained stringently hierarchical and, most importantly, stable. But if materiality and landscape analysis remain the focus of investigations to answer these questions of Angkorian religion, the study of architecture and the surrounding urban settlement of monasteries are especially important to understanding the dynamics of a period from which inscriptions are no longer extant yet construction is continuing. For example, in reference to the notion of mandala discussed earlier, the correlation of size shown here indirectly replicates the focality of the cosmic center of Angkor Thom, including its arterial roads with a peripheral boundary of smaller structures. Each structure and complex likely fulfilled the same ritual functions, but evidently those structures near the center had the capacity to host larger congregations and feature elegantly carved, likely quarried sandstone substructures. A picture for Savaros Pu, for example, suggested that monks may have been ordained at more prominent Pravihir complexes and built their own prayer halls where they lived with the resources at their disposal. And their pravihir, similar to temples, served as satellites of political religious authority for the regions in which they were constructed. The use of recycled stone to build these smaller structures on the periphery is notably abundant, as well stressing the inequality between monastic populations. Also key to upholding political religious authority across the Angkorian Empire was the standardized replication of a central religious sanctuary one which in our understanding of mandala unified the elites of the state under a common worldview and thus an imperial rule which strengthened the periphery of the state in relation to the center. Although no evidence has thus far been identified to suggest a central monastic hub within Angkor, the great monastery of Tep Pranam, Angkor's largest Buddhist church complex, is the most probable candidate to have fulfilled this role based on existing archeological evidence. Tep Pranam, which is found directly north of the Royal Palace, was continuously expanded by unknown factions under unknown monarchs, and no inscription exists to dedicate its initial foundation. However, an inscription was found there in 19, or 1908 that had been moved from a Buddhist ashram dedicated by the 9th century King Yashovarman I at least five centuries earlier. And Tepranam was actually thought to be the site of an early Hindu, Hindu building. The same inscription and its accompanying ashram was also rededicated by the 11th century King Suryavarman I, who despite constructing a temple mountain was a Buddhist. This stele clearly was moved with purpose as other foundation steles unrelated to Buddhism entirely have been found at other Buddhist terrace complexes as deposits. 
and potentially signify Tet Pranam as an established royal sanctuary. The actual ashram, which was identified fully um, in the early 2000s, is found more than four miles away and does not appear to have been used since its 11th century rededication. Visually, if correct, and of course we need to excavate more to establish the specifics, there appears to be a clear aim by Angkor's Buddhist populations and rulers to ensure a smooth transition between past and present principles of religious space. But how did Angkorian populations deal with the overwhelming number of Hindu and Mahayana Buddhist temples in their midst? Close to five centuries of temple mountains are found within the capital central zone still, and it's not yet clear whether any temples were demolished to build buildings or uh, build monastic buildings despite the abundant use of recycled sandstone. But the original temple space is a cella holding a lingam no longer exists at any of these temples. So how were these places reconciled with a new built environment, especially since a large number of the of temples were in fact converted? Well, first, as Joe de Guan described, a period of religious pluralism followed both Jayavarma and the eighth Hindu iconoclasm and the institutionalization of Theravada in the late 13th century. So this may have not even been an issue until the 14th, which marks the point when many Pravihir were inhabited if not constructed. But as Pravihir space began to become the predominant area of worship in Hindu practice, and or worship in Hindu practices were slowly phased out. Rather than, the, or rather than demolishing these temples, they were transformed or negotiated. Henri Lefebvre's live space or Edward Soja's third space provide key theoretical frameworks for understanding the types of processes embedded within converted temples and how conversions changed over time based on the perception of ancient monuments. I also want to importantly acknowledge that this research from an anthropological perspective was first undertaken by Dr. Ashley Thompson from SOAS, whose work was an important inspiration uh, for my own. One major indicator that temples were converted was the installation of a prescribed iconography likely imported from contemporary Thai Buddhist imagery, which is found represented in both standing statuary and reliefs. Each image intentionally depicts a specific episode in the life of the Buddha. The Parinirvana image on the lower left, for example, illustrates the Buddha breaking the life cycle and passing into Nirvana after his death. Whereas the earth touching Buddha in the both on the right is constructed in reference to Buddha's defeat of the demon Mara, asking the earth to witness his victory through touch. These images are almost almost constant, always constant across converted temples and are far more uniform than Hindu and Mahayana Buddhist iconography, which primarily owes to the centuries of local artistic development within Angkor rather than just their import. It's also probable that Buddhist terraces and converted temples were initially collectively standardized in their layout and temples such as Praya Palilai and Western Prasad Top thus may represent the first type of conversions found in Angkor. The latter's conversion, or at least its new Southern tower, based on the diagram here, has in fact been hypothesized to date from the late 13th century based on radiometric analysis by Nara, who are currently undertaking anastylosis at the temple. This was based, may have been based on a continued sacredness or scribes in the inner sanctuary in order to standardize these monuments, which is thought to have been converted into a reliquary in both cases. The placement of a of pravi here fronting the temple and either the replication or origin of this alignment between Buddhist terraces and reliquaries which is kind of a chicken and egg situation, especially through the uh, installation of the Pratyat reliquary, shows that there was an attempt to create uniform Angkorian Theravada space, regardless of the edifice. Also important to note with these initial temple conversions were their confinement to smaller structures, not the enormous state temples. These, if they were transformed, were subject to much larger renovations and either a blocking up or the overall demolition of their Mount Meru towers. At least one of these temples, the 11th century Bapuan on the right, was physically transformed during the 15th century into a 65 meter statue of a reclining Buddha Parinirvana at the expense of its central sanctuary, which is known from carbon dates taken from iron crampons embedded within the Buddha. In a similar manner, Angkor's first temple mountain, Nombak King, was physically transformed into a statue of the seated Buddha, similarly through the demolition of its towers. But research on this installation is impossible as early French conservators saw it as an eyesore and demolished it to reconstruct the original Mount Meru in the 1920s. And this image illustrates it's also possible that many Pratyat, once accessible, were blocked up or transformed into closed reliquaries during this period. Archival photographs show that this was not a modern re a renovation in the red box here. The construction of reliquaries and temple architecture as well as the tempo of temple conversions moving from accessible to closed are ideas I hope to investigate in future excavation season at Angkor, as it would create a better idea 
of when the central Hindu temple space was not only abandoned, but seen as negligible or even negatively charged. The placement of Buddhist terraces has thus far been proven to be rarely arbitrary. As I previously indicated in our excavations have unearthed radiometric, artifactual, structural, and even votive remains associated with earlier domestic or religious dwellings on the same site. However, the most unique patterns of Prapi here occur in relation to temples, as well as arterial roads. Based on connections to these elements, I refer to these alignments as foci of memory as a working hypothesis, whereby memory refers to the continued significance and reverence for ancient things over time and the reckoning of the past that populations undertook when establishing their futures across multi-temporal landscapes. Working with our data, I've established a few important caveats for each focus. Each appears to honor and re-legitimize or reify a Brahmano Buddhist sanctuary within its place in the landscape which in turn reinforced and legitimated the original layout of Angkor Thom, its roadways and its individual monuments. Renovations are all, and conversions are also common amongst temples that anchor foci. The key concept as well, number two, is old infrastructure and new property here found within each focus embody a reciprocal relationship whereby neither is sacred within the Theravada, Ther Theravada Buddhist landscape without the other. Third, what is found in Angkor Thom is the culmination of each focus, and it is unknown whether these areas were developed gradually or immediately. However, none of them, none of the foci are found in any epigraph epigraphic records and are inferred through analysis of map data, and thus the flexibility of this heuristic enables additional interpretation. So this is just a hypothesis, but it seems to have some spatial relevance. The Bayon, for example, form the focal point of a concentric layout of Buddhist terraces, none of which are identical. This suggests that this focus was created gradually rather than as a single act of construction, and that monasteries in the focus were not created by a single faction, but several over time. Still, by coincidence or by some continuous perception of the Bayon, the layout today resembles a mandala surrounding the temple and clearly cements the Bayon as the continuous pivot of the citadel. Another example is found in the form of a staggered line of Buddhist terraces spanning the entire longitudinal thoroughfare of Angkor Thom, only interrupted by the central zone which during survey we called the North-South Gate Road zigzag. Interestingly, Joe Deguan attributes some significance to at least the Southern portion of this route in his writings, as you can see in the quote in the bottom right. This thoroughfare also features a large number of structures with fired brick remains. Bricks, interestingly, had not been used en masse in Angkorian architecture since the late 10th to early 11th centuries, when they were replaced almost entirely by a combination of sandstone and laterite. And it's therefore likely bricks were reintroduced to Angkorian architecture by means of expanding Thai influence, where brick and plaster construction during this period are abundant. Additionally, brick renovations appear on top of sandstone and laterite, so it's likely that this was a later installation. We excavated one of the structures along the route, and like other Pravi here across the citadel, we dated a bone deposit near the central sanctuary to the 14th century. According to contemporary Thai sources, Angkor was successfully attacked in 1431 by armies from the Thai kingdom of Ayutthaya. Ayutthaya, though Buddhist, embodied the same rigid social hierarchy, standardized replication of architecture, divine rulership rights, and even the idea of constructing a temple mountain at their island capital north of, north of Bangkok as within Hindu Angkor. And the geopolitical expansion of Ayutthaya between the 14th and 15th centuries is thought to have been a major cause of the decommission of Angkor as the capital of Cambodia, while Cambodia's ruling class left the region for a series of capitals surrounding modern Phnom Penh over the ensuing three centuries. Scholars such as Michael Vickery highlight the possibility that an Ayutian prince occupied Angkor Thom at some point during the mid 15th century, but for all intents and purposes, the old citadel was no longer a significant civic ceremonial center. Angkor too was now positioned squarely on Cambodia's frontier. Radiometric dates are found, uh, found across Angkor Thom, including from our own research, indicate the possibility of a 15th century upper limit of occupation, and cores taken from the Angkor Thom moat by Dan Penny's team from the University of Sydney suggest overall hydraulic neglect during this period, which he describes as swamp-like. Seriations of Chinese ceramics undertaken by Iadarath, David Brotherson, and others show an absence of Ming Dynasty that is late 14th to 15th century blue and white Chinese export wares at Pravihir sites, as opposed to Song Dynasty, 11th to 14th century, as well as Yuan Dynasty, Celadon and whitewares, which indicate a relative lack of habitational or votive activities beyond the 15th century. The Great Temple of Angkor Wat to the south, meanwhile, was transformed into a prominent Buddhist pilgrimage site during the 16th century. This conversion may have in fact occurred earlier as two Buddhist terraces were constructed there, 
which according to Cambodian Royal Chronicles, date from the years following Angkor's defeat by Ayutthaya. Angkor Wat was originally constructed by King Suryavarma II during the early to mid 12th century as a shrine to Vishnu and holds the recognition as the world's largest religious monument. The temple is known especially for its 1.6 kilometers of reliefs, including an earlier illustration of the churning of the ocean of milk. An activity at the temple is documented in an expansive volume of inscriptions in the Khmer language dating from 1546 CE onwards and was continuously patronized by the royal family who walled up the old central sanctuary of the centermost tower with Buddha friezes, decommissioning the earlier vision cella. While a less destructive act than the Bapuan or Phnom Bak Kang re-envisioning, this blocking up of space clearly reflects similar perceptions of earlier temple sanctuaries either, as either defunct or dangerous. Inscriptions too, clearly engage with memory, venerating the august ancestors and Angkor's previous kings. To conclude, the landscape of Buddhist terraces slash Pravi here illustrates a unique and localized adoption of Theravada Buddhism in Angkor Thom and central Angkor, one which was required to negotiate the built environment of institutionalized political religious authority, but also propagate this new religious practice in a unique framework which would guarantee its success. Theravada at Angkor, I contend, was manifested nowhere else the same in Southeast Asia. The construction and placement of these new structures honored earlier material and spatial ritual traditions, highlighting the importance of core periphery relations and religious placemaking, while also serving as an innovative advancement which cemented Pravihir as familiar religious architectures. The incorporation of Hindu and Mahayana Buddhist infrastructure into Theravada Buddhist understandings of place was also indeed an evolving process, although more research is necessary to understand any of these theoretical avenues. And finally, Angkor Thom serves as a fascinating and important case study for religious transition in the archaeological record, one which, unlike more prominent civic ceremonial centers such as Rome, Athens, or even Sukhothai, which was once itself a town on the Khmer frontier, contains a relatively undisturbed archaeological record, where the idealization of history and search for origins did not come at the expense of the site's more recent history, which is aside from that poor little Buddha at Phnom Bak Hang. Ideas of social memory, indigenous of time, continuity rather than the phasing and apocalization of history, and even modern perception of these sacred sites by local worshippers can easily and accurately be analyzed here, with local collaboration, the prioritization of Cambodian academic goals, and honoring of Angkor's everlastingly spiritually charged nature being paramount to all successful future research. And these are just some of our goals for the upcoming two field seasons in 2022, as well as one possibly in 2023. And I'd love to hear your questions. Again, it's been an honor to present for all of you at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. This is a, really a rich presentation. I think we'll have a lot of uh, questions here. Um, so what I'd like to do is open it up to the audience. Um, Andrew, maybe you can stop the screen share, but we may ask you to pull up some images later, but you seem to be pretty good at going back and forth between it so we can see the faces of people asking questions. So if anyone has a question, I suggest you use the um, raise hand function of Zoom and then I'll call on you and I'll keep a list as they start appearing uh, to try to get an order to our questions. Um, so I'll wait for a moment as people collect their thoughts and I look forward to hearing from you. Um, so I will start with Eric White. Um, Eric, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for the, the talk. So I'm not a specialist of Cambodia or Cambodian Buddhism. Okay. I work on contemporary Thai, Thailand, Thai Buddhism. So my question is more comparative, sort of builds off of your, some of your closing comments. And it's, and the, you know, it's said in this, I, I'm often concerned that there's, there is an overemphasis on the similarities, right, of mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhist cultures and histories across the region. Uh, you know, they all, rather than thinking about multiple Theravada Buddhisms in the region, there's often a kind of uh, a tendency to, to sort of uh, conflate. Uh, beliefs and practices, pantheons, literary material culture sometimes. So mm -hmm. in that light, you know, how, how do you see the character and dynamics of the introduction and consolidation of Theravada Buddhism in Cambodia uh, differing from dynamics 
uh, of the introduction of Theravada Buddhism in other uh, regions, right, or other polities in this in this pre-modern era. You know, you sort of mentioned you gestured towards these unique lo local character, and I'm wondering if you could actually, you know, for a if you could sort of itemize even, you know, just list out what you saw, what you see as uniquely in terms of the character and dynamics. And, um, and especially if you see them having enduring significance for the, for the character of Cambodian Buddhism in later periods, right? So thinking about essentially path dependencies, the way that initial differences have had enduring consequences. Mm. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I think I think coming from my perspective, which is more archeological and anthropological, I can't necessarily talk to the rites and rituals involved. The inscriptions are lacking. It's not quite clear how uh, Buddhism was first practiced. And we like to talk about Sinhalese Buddhism, but again, you just can't say that. With Angkor, what we're finding in the archeological record is a, dis is a discerning attempt to create a worldview that makes sense to the people and the hierarchies that exist. The idea that religious dissemination is successful, not based on chaos, but based on continuity, is something that we're seeing within the Angkorian archaeological record. The idea that, and this is, these are things that I had to take out, otherwise the presentation would have been hours, but uh, the architecture itself in many of the late 13th, early 14th century structures is not recycled. It's quarried and it's carved in a way that almost is identical to the way that one would enter a temple. You see Buddhist terraces at Angkor Thom with balustrades and single lions that are easily recognizable. You see the idea that the sanctuary is, always has is faced eastward. And the only time it hadn't in Angkorian history was when the temple was dedicated to Vishnu. And so there seems to be this idea that Buddhism at Angkor is unique because of not necessarily Hinduism, not necessarily what was practiced before in terms of religious practice, but the space itself, the, the idea that this is what we know as a, as a place of worship. The Pratyat is the temple. It's not, it's not a question of, uh, it's not a question of how is, are we going to include the temple? It's where does the temple go? It's not even a thought. It's where does the temple go? And over time, as I mentioned, as Ayutian uh, traditions become stronger and geopolitically become more dominant in the region, you do see this shift towards a more, Thai, a more Thai, not necessarily religious version, but material version of Buddhism, which is, again, an incredibly controversial point in the 20th and 21st century. But at the same time, um, there is a Cambod there is, you're right, a uniquely Cambodian tradition, a uniquely Thai tradition, which admittedly comes mostly from the 20th century when the French div uh, essentially did not allow Cambodian monks to travel to Thailand. They said, you cannot be indoctrinated here. We're going to create our own school. And this is the way to make sure that our territory is consolidated within Cambodia is to break that. So there, the tradition has been much more modern than ancient. And so within early Theravada, it's much easier to tell a distinct, a distinct difference between regions and what was adopted. And I think maybe that gives us some, maybe that's a somewhat meandering uh, answer to your question, but I, I think I would stand by the idea that this was, as I say, localized based on what people knew of religious space. Thanks. No problem. Uh, Andrew, while we're waiting for other questions, um, I wanna ask you a question about spatial location versus spatial orientation. Okay. And I, I just made this idea up, so it may be totally uh, unusual or strange. Um, but I as I was listening to you uh, throughout the talk and then hearing your response to Eric's question as well, um, you were noting that the importance of a kind of recognition of a particular religious space of worship. So mm -hmm. in a sense, it's a kind of location, right? There's a spot on the map, in a sense, that seems to have accrued meaning as a place of religious practice or mm -hmm. worship or something. And there's actually a kind of historical... Uh, respect for that and actually a reproduction of that space, even mm -hmm. if there's a shift in the actual spatial practice that happens in that space, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but as you were answering that, you also said, well, you can really see like uh, when it faces east, you know that never happened before until this 
uh, this orientation comes along, right? And so I'm curious if there's ways in the map rec so the location's the same, but the orientation is turned. And I'm wondering if there's ways in your mapping practice that you can systematically notice that. And tied to this is just another question that I had was, um, as you were talking about the um, the kind of respect for a previous religious practice that had place, even if there's a religious transformation that happens, that struck me as very interesting in comparison to one little example you showed where there was the smashed out Buddha image. Yeah. I think it was from the 13th century, right? Mm -hmm. Which is clearly not a respect of the previous no. practice, but it's still in the same place. Um, it so is. That's, I, I'm just wondering if you could play with that idea of orientation versus location. Sure. Um, what I actually had said about the orientation of uh, Buddhist terraces was they face east, which was not a shift. It was actually something that made them similar to Shiva temples. It was something that that they face east, which is a direction derived from in reverence to Indra. And in terms of the iconography, the iconoclasm, it was actually something that in, when I was writing my thesis, I toyed around with as an earlier re-envisioning of the Angkorian landscape. Mahayana Buddhism was something that was revolutionary and new and tied to a king, maybe one or two kings. It's not quite clear whether Jayavarman's successor, Indravarman II, was a Mahayana Buddhist. But it was a sense that these sanctuaries could be used, could be reinterpreted. All they needed was the images gone, Jayavarman gone, and they were still perfectly good sanctuaries. They still were recognizable. They were still oriented in a way that was understandable. They still housed populations. They still housed laborers and were, were the foci of, of, polit of political and economic systems that they were before. So it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting idea, to say the least. And I think there, there actually has been a good amount of work done on the architecture itself, but not necessarily on what types of things iconoclasm and what types of ask what what happens when an image gets hacked out of a temple or gets transformed there were actually several that were buddhas were transformed into lingams and into rishis or saints and so what does that mean and how do we uh, how do we look more at that because the way that Angkorian history is often constructed is that it, there's periods of boom and bust continuously boom and bust boom and bust and this one was a dramatic event and every time a king returned to some sort of royal cult, every single time there's always violence. There's always thought to be violence. Iconoclasm is a violent act in itself, but it's, but it's not clear from the 13th century, although Jada Guan mentions a war with Sukhothai, that the Angkorian kingdom was in any sort of tumult, climatological issues aside. So I would like to, I really would like to explore more about the iconoclasm of Hinduism. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something to, to investigate further. I think, I, again, again, another meandering answers your question. Can I ask just a brief uh, technical follow-up question that may be obvious to all the archaeologists in the room? But how does one, I, I can understand how one might date existing objects, but how does one date when something was destroyed? Um, like, for example, the hacking away of a Buddha face, it removes the material. So what kind of, how does one actually date that? They don't. And then that's part of, that's part of sort of, it, it adds up. And so deductive reasoning is used. There's two theories on the iconoclasm. One that it occurred during the reign of Jaivar Me. And the second is in a sort of newer reaction is that it occurred during the reign of uh, Jaivar and Parameshvara, who was the last Hindu king. And according to the Cambodian Royal Chronicles, he was in fact assassinated by his gardener. So there was Theravada Buddhist kings after that. So those are kind of the two ideas. And through archaeology, you unless there's residue on an axe, you really can't do it. It's it's all it's all speculative. You have to hope more epigraphy comes up. Um. I see a hand up from Ward Keeler, and Ben has uh, appeared on video. So I'll call on Ward Keeler first and then turn to Ben after that. Go ahead, Ward. Uh, thanks. I um, um, work in Burma and Indonesia, so Cambodia is really quite uh, foreign to me. But I wonder if um, a pattern that seems discernible all over Southeast Asia doesn't help your explanation. That is to say that 
any site can be, uh, can be seen to be a residue of enormous amounts of power, of um, spiritual power, whatever you want to call it. It's just, there's a node of power there that is available to be tapped. So of course you would want to keep the place because these places are imbued with that kind of power. At the same time, every religious reform movement is a way for those uh, in power to uh, divert more power to themselves, to make a break with the past, to show some sort of new direction that enables them to do things like, you know, what happens in Burmese history is that uh, all the monks have to uh, be re, um, reinitiated, which means a completely new order to the, to the hierarchy. So I, I just wonder if that makes sense as a way of putting together the different parts of what you have uh, described. Fully, 100%. And that's that's what's missing from the equation is really any, any royal record of what's going on at Angkor. You don't know why Theravada Buddhism seeped in. People have painted it as a social revolution, which is something that, I, that I've disputed. Um, and it's the continuities we see in the archaeological record indeed reflect the idea that power is consolidated and spaces remain sacred. Again, why, why not build something familiar if you're working with familiar power. So I, I fully agree with that. Andrew, thanks very much for a very informative and uh, uh, fascinating and re revealing presentation. A, a lot of it was new to me and I learned a lot from it. Um, I wonder if you would agree that we're talking about a, a major transformation in Cambodian society here, uh, not just a religious transformation, but uh, uh, political and social transformation as well in the uh, 14th and 15th centuries. And uh, where I wonder if you'd like to comment on some of the traditional explanations for that transformation or those transformations and, and, and how your explanation and your observations fit in to these sort of more longstanding or, or traditional uh, explanations. You know, one of them that's been around for a long time is that Jayavarman the seventh who, who built Angkor Thom uh, with his 40 year reign uh, and massive building program just exhausted the Cambodian population uh, and led to you know a, a major uh, change in the in the popular uh, image of, of uh, centralized a centralized empire and kingdom and a move to a more village-oriented uh, Theravada Buddhist uh, society away from a Hindu and Mahayana Buddhist uh, society. But uh, there are two other more recent explanations which might, uh, I'd be interested to hear your comments on. Uh, one of them is that it was a change in uh, world trade patterns that uh, the uh, world trade going past the South China Sea uh, made the option very attractive for the uh, Angkorian elites to move further south, south down the river to be closer to the South China Sea trade and, and Angkor was abandoned basically for uh, an, an inland agrarian society changed to a maritime commercial society uh, and that may be something uh, that, that uh, the Theravada Buddhism and its adoption broadly across Cambodia had something to do with that uh, economic change. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. we have the climate explanation mm -hmm. as well. Uh, the, you know, the 1300s uh, were basically the, the end of the uh, medieval warm period. It became much less uh, wet, a lot drier and uh, more frequent droughts in the late 1300s and early 1400s. Does that have anything to do with the transformation that you're uh, talking about? And, and, and finally, just a quick question related to what you're talking about. And I, I just wonder whether the uh, dominance in Jayavarman VII's reign of Mahayana Buddhism, which was unusual for compared to previous Angkorian monarchs, even though uh, Mahayana Buddhism was part of the religious structure along with Hinduism. But mm -hmm. the unusual predominance of Mahayana Buddhism, was that in a way a kind of transitional phase towards 
a new kind of uh, Theravada Buddhist, a, a Theravada Buddhist transition that uh, was made uh, possible uh, rather than precipitated, as another explanation might have it, uh, by, by Jayabama in the seventh reign. So, as we know, in the, 13, in the, in the 1200s, right after the death of Jayabama the seventh, the Angkor got rocked by event after event after event. First, mega monsoons and mega droughts almost is, are believed to have begun to decimate the, hydro, uh, the hydrology of Angkor and, and greater Angkor, most notably during that period. Then you have the hypotheses of depopulation, of uh, plague, of just of expansion from other polities. Sukhothai and, uh, Sukhothai and Ayutthaya successively, uh, or successively expanded during this period. So in terms of Theravada Buddhism, even though these things seem to correlate, Jayavarman exploited the resources of the capital, um, as, as Lawrence Briggs wrote, the Khmer, the Khmer got licked by religion or something that quote. Um, but it's very, it's very hard and just not wise quite yet to connect Theravada Buddhism and, the so, and any sort of social upheaval to those events. They seem to make sense. But again, I'd like to see, I just as an archaeologist, I'd like to see the connection between monastic construction and any type of climatological fluctuation uh, in more than just more than just circumstantial events happening around the same time. It's, it, it, it's, it's a very logical explanation, but again, dangerous without more evidence on my part, at least. In terms of trade, um, there was, I mean, there's, there's theories that the focus moved to the Mekong Delta before the traditional sack of Angkor. Before the, I mean, it was a logical place based on the trade wealth in the South China Sea that was coming in. And we, I mentioned, as I mentioned, um, we do have evidence of an upper limit potentially at Buddhist terraces of Angkor Tom based on those Chinese ceramic seriations. The idea that there have not been any blue and whites found, although there have been blue and whites found down at Angkor Wat by Allison Carter's team or down by, uh, by Gap. So there's none up here yet. And you know, there might be, you do another excavation on another site, you might find some later occupation, but we're not finding that yet. Um, in terms of Jaya Varman and the uh, introduction of Theravada by way of Mahayana, I think, as I mentioned, that has more to do with the activity and consolidation of the frontier or the Western frontier where Theravada Buddhism was being practiced. Around areas like Pimai, you do have populations that are that are Buddhist and had been for a while. Surya Varman the second or the first is thought to have been from Pimai. The architect of Batchum uh, under Rajendra Varman was thought to be from Pimai. And you might just simply have more engagement on that cultural frontier than you otherwise would have in the past based on, on the repaving and restructuring of the roads. And so that creates a floodgate as well as if populations were being absorbed under that, under that hegemony. Again, speculative and needs more archaeology, needs more cooperative archaeology. And that's why I hesitate to construct a narrative beyond what we know from Joe Deguan onwards. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have a, another question from Louise Court. Uh, Louise, if you can uh, ask your question. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't turn on my camera. It seems to be broken. Not a problem, nice um, to meet you. Going to go from these really broad and fascinating questions to a very minute point that you made in passing, Andrew. Sure. Got my attention as someone interested in the development of ceramic production in the Angkor region. Um, you mentioned showing a group of Chinese shards. Mm -hmm. There were also finds, and I believe it was from the excavation of one of the Buddhist terraces of the kinds of green glazed or celadon glazed lidded boxes that were a major product of the kiln on top of Don Kulen. Yes, and I talked to Ia Dareth about that. He was, he was very happy about that, that we were finding. We, we only found them at two sites, um, one of which was uh, our major excavation site where we found more than a couple of shards. And the other one was a site that was surrounded by the remains of a necropolis. And those shards were actually associated with the base of stupa. Mm -hmm. So they may have been uh, considered luxury goods in that perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But 
um, the production of covered boxes like that goes back to a point earlier than uh, the date you've been giving for the introduction of Theravada uh, by several centuries. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether this is a very micro scale example of how um, production of a certain kind of object within the Angkorian material culture could be um, shifted in use from uh, some kind of offering equipment for a Hindu context into a Theravada Buddhist context? Sure. Um, I was actually thinking about this one right after we excavated the, the boxes. And there's kind of two ways you can think about it. The first is that it, those boxes were considered ancient goods and were considered and were given as votive deposits and then thus are kind of anachronistic. Uh, the other is that they were from an earlier era of occupation on the same site. On three of the four sites that we excavated, we found, uh, we found ceramic offerings or not uh, ceramic offerings, ceramic remains that dated from an earlier period as sort of related to the stratigraphy of our radiocarbon dates. And so there is a thought that at least in one of, at least with the site with the gypsum foundation stone we found, which was actually mm -hmm. surrounded by bones and charcoal, that you might have the site of an earlier religious occupation. And then A, that gives you more sense of why they may have constructed the Buddhist terrace where they did. And mm -hmm. B, um, you, have some context that's actually temporarily appropriate to where you find the box and it doesn't necessarily throw things out of whack okay. again this, okay. is, this is something to validate with more with uh, more field work i think yes please please do <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it thank you for that fascinating question and thank you andrew for such a wonderful engaging talk in the q a um what thank i'm going to do is i'm going to stop the recording now and then leave the chat, leave the session open for another 15 minutes or so for informal chit chat. You can imagine this, everyone is after the talk, you can come up to the podium and chat with the speaker. So I will stop the recording right now and please stay if you feel like it. <laughs>